They say uh, when you're in a car accident that time slows down, and I can tell you for a fact that that's true. On August the 19th, less than a month ago, at about quarter past eight on a Sunday morning, I was driving down East Link, uh, which is a toll road in Melbourne. It's a very wide, a very straight road. The night before, there had been hailstorms, and as I was driving south on East Link, I could see rain clouds approaching. And as the rain uh, got to my car, I put on the wipers on full, and I was in the middle lane, and I was passing a car on my left. And the wipers were giving me a clear view of the road, and I thought, everything's great. And then I thought, the road looks a little bit different, the road looks a little bit strange. And my personal neural net was dealing with uh, some sample data that I'd never seen in quite a few years of driving. And I made the decision to wait and after I'd passed this car, to look out the driver's side window, which didn't have rain on it, to see what was happening with the, the, the road. And those few seconds made all the difference. It wasn't just my internal neural net that uh, wasn't uh, able to deal with the data. My car was over uh, 10 years old as well. And it didn't have all the latest in image recognition tools and emergency brake assist and adaptive cruise control and all the great things that come in new cars. And it really made me understand quite personally that there are real-world applications to this image recognition thing. Now, at Amazon, we've been doing machine learning and image recognition for over 20 years. So we've been using it in recommendations engines, our logistics, um, delivery uh, recently, and you've heard the Alexa joke before, we're using it for voice assistance and voice, voice interactions. And we opened the Amazon Go store in Seattle which allows you to go in and scan the mobile app and then take what you want off the shelves and your Amazon account gets billed. Um, so it's a checkout-less experience. But this image processing, you know, this image uh, processing and machine learning process is quite hard. As Jenny's already talked about in the earlier session, you need to get a lot of data and then you need to prepare the data, normalise it, annotate it, and then you need to take it to the cloud where you can use the abundance of GPUs and CPUs to process and build and train these models. And then you need to evaluate it with test data, and that's great, but then you need to launch it out into the real world. And once you put it out into the real world, that's when you get feedback about how applicable these are in reality. So if you're thinking about um, a common approach to, to people putting out models is it, you know, they come out sort of 95% accurate, perhaps is really good, and then after a few iterations, they can get it to 100%. And a lot of this has to do with the real-world data that you're getting back. So if you're an autonomous vehicle manufacturer or you're building uh, image recognition safety solutions for cars, a lot would depend on the data that you'd had back. And if you'd received data from millions of hours of passenger journeys, you might have seen the road conditions that uh, presented to me on Eastlink and made a decision in milliseconds about how to react where it took me seconds to react. This is not New England, this is the suburbs of Melbourne. And we launched the uh, service SageMaker uh, to make that cycle of improvement and iteration a lot easier. We removed the undifferentiated heavy lifting as much as possible and we continue to iterate on this service to make it more effective. And when I think of SageMaker, I think about it in these three areas. I think about it to build, train, and deploy uh, machine learning models. And when I say build, you get a hosted Jupyter Notebook, which is great because it's right near where your data is stored. You can collaborate. You've got security controls. Uh, the Jupyter Notebook and uh, part of the SageMaker service is you have access to the SDKs, so you can then train a model in the cloud. And that is great because it spins up the infrastructure you need to train the model and spins it down, so you only pay for the billable seconds. And the model I'll show you uh, later used 186 seconds. So you can get that idea, you can really speed up how you can improve these models. The other thing is we have uh, parameter optimization in SageMaker. So as we see people training lots of models, we use machine learning on machine learning to, to, to improve this process. And then the third part of machine learning is you deploy the model, and you've got this discrete 
trained model which you use to do inference, so to detect um, conditions. And that can be deployed in the cloud to a cloud endpoint, um, and it can also be deployed now into edge devices. Now, all of this process is great, and we speak to customers. One of the things that they uh, come back at us with is, that's great, but I don't have the data ready. Or I do have the data, but I don't know how to make it ready. And I've been speaking to a, Sparta, a startup recently in Melbourne, and there's other customers doing this. They're using a service of ours that uh, has been around for uh, longer than S3, would you believe? It's called Mechanical Turk. And Mechanical Turk allows you to take jobs which require human cognition and send it to a marketplace of workers who can uh, go through and process this data. And some of our best machine learning customers are sending their images to this service, and they're saying, I want it annotated with data around you know, what objects are in there and where they are, and the, the worker place in the Mechanical Turks uh, market come back and annotate it at a cost-effective manner. And they also use techniques like um, putting in images that they've already annotated so they can see which workers are doing the best job and make sure that the, the workers are doing the best job getting uh, all the, the work for this. Another service we have is this machine learning solutions lab, which is based in the US, and you can engage with your account team and with our professional services group, and we can arrange for this team to help you with training for machine learning model, but also to help you get started on building those first few models as well. So that's an option that's available to you as well. So if we're looking at machine learning in the cloud, we're looking at these four things. We're looking at application services. So they're services where we build and train and maintain the model, so like recognition and poly and lex and those types of things. But then for models you build and train yourself, you train and you tune them in the cloud, and you can do the inference from the cloud, so you can you know, run the trained model in the cloud. Now, one of the insights and one of the trends that's happening is I'm an IoT specialist. There's lots of devices connecting to the internet, billions of devices. One of the things about these devices is they're getting more powerful and they can do more things. So you now have this option of running the inference of your trained machine learning models in the cloud or doing it down at the edge, in edge devices, in the context in which you're working. So in regards to cars, that could be within your car or vehicle, could be within your factory, it could be um, in, uh, say, a ship at sea, for example. And some examples that Amazon have around machine learning and doing this inference at the edge is our Alexa uh, devices, so the Amazon Echoes. So if you've used an Amazon Echo device, you'll know that it's very quick in responding. And part of that is by design. So as soon as you say the wake word, which is commonly Alexa, and I'm, I don't want to say it because I'm sure somewhere an Alexa will trigger when I say that. Um, <laughs> when you say the wake word, that immediately starts streaming the extended request to the cloud where that processing is done in the cloud. So this is a hybrid approach of doing some machine learning in the edge device and some in the cloud. And the side effect of that is really low latency response, which customers love when they're interacting with these devices. Another device uh, we have is the Deep Lens, which I have on stage, which was launched at reInvent last year. And this allows developers to build their own image recognition models and deploy them to run inside the device. So it's great, you don't need to stream video to the cloud, you can um, do the processing inside the device and only send the data to the cloud, very low latency response. And this device, a little bit on the details, the geeking out about it, it's got an Intel Atom processor, it's got an Intel GPU, eight gig of RAM, uh, it's yeah, HDMI port, a couple of USB ports, uh, it's, it's quite a solid device, it runs a version of Ubuntu that you can um, if you're a Ubuntu fan, you will be quite familiar with how to get around on the device. And you buy the device and you can very quickly register it with your AWS account, and then you can deploy sample projects within sort of half an hour to, to see how it works. And each deep lens can have one project at a time. And a project uh, consists of a model and a function, and the model is the trained image recognition model. So if you train a model to understand hot dog, no hot dog, in the cloud, you then can deploy that particular image, recogn uh, <laughs> image recognition model down to this device. Function, the other part of a project, refers to Lambda functions. So the deep lens under the hood is running Greengrass, which is our IoT edge platform, which allows you to 
author lambda functions in the cloud and then have those lambda functions running inside the device. So by combining a model which does the recognition and the function, you can, you can get these to, to start processing and doing useful work at the edge. And the Deep Lens comes with tight integration with our services. It's one of the benefits of using a cloud platform that all the services integrate quite nicely. And you can just choose a, a trained model that you've built in SageMaker and just add it to the device straight in the console like that. Now, if you're a visual type person, I'll explain it through the diagram how it works. You've got the camera there. It's running Deep Lens inside, which is our edge platform, which runs on virtually any kind of CPU-bound device. The Lambda code in there, oh, first of all, you have uh, the cameras seeing something, and you can stream through the unfiltered video through to what's called the device stream, and that's really good for uh, troubleshooting, so you know what the, um, the device is actually seeing. The Lambda code, which is part of the project, is running inside Greengrass, and that gets the last frame, the last image, and then it runs it through the model, and it extracts the data from the image that you're looking to extract, and then it sends that up to the AWS IoT servers and it uses MQTT, which is a lightweight TCP IP based protocol to send that to the cloud, and it just sends the, the JSON payload with the, the data that uh, you're looking to extract. So very lightweight, you don't need a really powerful or a lot of uh, bandwidth to send that up. And then you have optionally this project stream, which is uh, a way of demonstrating what's happening visually on the device, and it's great when you're standing up in front of the people like uh, today to be able to show you visually what's happening, but it's not needed in a real world world situation. And just to, to dive into the code a little bit, this is an example of the Lambda function that runs on the device. And if you're a developer, the bits I'd point out to you is the Greengrass SDK. So there's an SDK that if you write Lambda functions for Greengrass or for Deep Lens, you have access to this SDK, which allows you to subscribe to and publish MQTT messages directly uh, via the Greengrass Gateway to the cloud and to other devices. And as you can see, there's an IoT topic there uh, at the bottom line. That's how the data is being published up to the cloud. Another uh, difference or option you had with lambdas in, at the edge in Greengrass and in Deep Lens is you have this idea of doing a long-lived local lambda, which is a lot of alliteration. Now, that means that in the cloud, lambdas are event-driven, so something happens, the lambda function runs, and then it, it stops. On the green grass or a deep lens device, you can have these uh, functions running perpetually. And as you can see with the code here, it's running in uh, a, a continuous loop. And the first uh, function in the loop is to get the last frame, and that's using the, uh, the libraries that uh, come with uh, deep lens. And then the last line there is, is running the inference against the, um, the actual received image. Another little bit of code I wanted to point out is this function that's made available by Intel. It's a very simple function. Very simply, what that does is it takes the trained model which you've trained and deployed to the device and optimizes it for the hardware on the device. And that's actually quite useful if you're building prototypes in this device and you come up with something you want to take to production. Uh, it uh, allows you to use these common functions across Intel chipsets. Now, the model I'm going to demonstrate to you today is actually uh, traffic and car related, which is topical for me. I've trained a machine learning model to recognize German road signs, and that was, there was an existing project some colleagues of mine were working on, and it's trained against 50,000 images. You can see some examples there. They're kind of low res and blurry. Uh, there's 42 different road signs that it's classifying against, so it's, it's trying to classify in the image um, what it's most confident it's seeing as far as these 42 uh, road signs. So we'll stop and we'll jump across to the deep lens and have a look at this in action. Okay, so we can see this. So the first one I'd like to start with is a, a no entry sign. It's very distinctive. There aren't many other signs like uh, no entry signs. If I put this in front of the device, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, the AWS IoT MQTT test client can fall a little bit behind if you send it too many things, so I've slowed down the loop a little bit. So as you can see, it's classifying in order of confidence level what it's seeing, and it's most confident that this is a no entry sign, which is great. 
Now, uh, part of training this model, I spent maybe two to four hours on this. Uh, it gives you an idea of how quick you can get to that 95% um, when you're, you're building models. So this is a bicycle's crossing example. As you can see, it's pretty sure it's bicycles crossing, and sometimes it thinks it's wild animals. So, um, and that's got to do with the, the quality of the images that are, uh, are being ingested into it. So, uh, especially when you get signs which look similar, you know, the triangles and there's some detail. This is children crossing, and if you're a parent, you'd say these are the wild animals. Um, as you can see, it's children crossing there. And there's a little bit of a delay as we go. And now some of those road signs, as I mentioned, are quite similar. So this is a head only and a left turn ahead, which are signs that we don't necessarily have in Australia. But And what you're seeing on the screen here is that project stream. This is the optional bit. So it's good for demonstrating to a live audience, demonstrating the capabilities of machine learning. But it's not necessary in a production situation. And this is, as I said, this can sometimes get a little bit confused around um, the difference between a head only and, and left turn a head only. As you see, this one's not, oh, there we go. Have patience and you'll be rewarded. Well, for a second I was awarded, <laughs> rewarded. Now, uh, I've actually done this session quite a few times and the first few times I ran it, it was really inaccurate and then it just started getting better and I hadn't changed anything in the model and I realized that Perhaps the model is actually starting to train me on the best way to, to hold these uh, cards in front of it. The last one I wanted to show is a, a speed sign. And this is interesting because I don't think this is the best method of detecting uh, speed signs. And you'll see why. It detects uh, a lot of... It just basically detects it's a speed sign. I mean, sure, you could say if you take the average of those speeds, it might come out to 60, but I wouldn't be building this into my autonomous car. A better approach would be to recognise that this is a speed sign and then use a single shot detection to crop out that and send it to an optical uh, character recognition uh, service, which they're, they're quite mature models that could then just extract the, the digits from it. Now we switch to the laptop. I'll show you this, what's happening on the cloud side. So this is the console for the deep lens. Uh, you can see the version there and you can deploy updates. This is the MQTT topic here. If I co copy that, and I go across to my test client, and I paste in that topic. We can see what's coming from the device. And this is, allows you to, you can see what's coming through. So this is coming through live from the device. If I hold up um, my no entry sign, wherever it went. Anyone see where my no entry sign went? There it is. After a little delay, you'll see that the packets coming through will say no entry. It's the most uh, confident entry. It's very confident that it's no entry. So we go back to the presentation now. So as you can see, uh, you can build these models really quickly. And so that was a lot of fun for me to build. It's, uh, you can see the applicability of these techniques, but you'd want to go out and retrain these models and gather real-world data and improve the, um, the inference accuracy. A little bit of a recap, that's what's happening under the hood. You've got this green grass runtime, which has the machine learning model deployed to it, a lambda codes, getting the last frame, and it's just sending that data to the cloud. So it's running green grass. It's this our edge platform that's important to understand because if you build something useful with a deep lens, you can use green grass and build this into any kind of uh, CPU-bound gateway or device. And we've got customers who have built this into a green grass running in VMware. Um, connecting to traffic cameras, and we've got customers, and I'll demonstrate, I'll show a video of one soon who's used existing uh, cameras and put their own gateway um, to do this sort of processing. You can take out that deep lens out of this, and you can replace it with virtually any kind of connected device. We've got a large group of partners that you can bring to this now, including VMware, Qualcomm, Intel, NVIDIA, etc. Now, I wanted to just quickly go back to this command. This is the function that allows you to optimize the model for an Intel chipset. Now, this is actually part of the Intel OpenVINO toolkit, which uh, Intel provide. And this is great because if you've built it for an Intel Atom, that's great. But if you then want to take it to a, um, uh, a Xeon chip or a field programmable gate array, 
you can actually use the same function across all those chipsets, and it'll optimize for that chipset. So that means you have one code base for potentially all your uh, image processing at edge requirements. And this particular uh, tool kit comes with uh, built-in uh, compatibility with uh, OpenCV and OpenVX, and it also comes with a whole bunch of pre-trained models for common things like pedestrians, vehicles, etc. Now I'm going to show you a quick video. This is a customer of ours, or a partner of ours, uh, Big Mate, who's built this solution around logistics safety, and um, it's uh, it uses green grass at the edge, and it's the video is actually narrated by Amazon Polly, just for a little bit of a, um, a novelty. Hi, we are all part of Amazon Polly and I am going to walk you through this short presentation. Warehouse safety is paramount with people and machinery in a constant state of movement. Our challenge is to monitor the warehouse and generate localized alerts when people and machinery get too close as well as provide metrics to enable review and improvement of safe operation. We do this at the edge by monitoring the CCTV cameras and detecting potentially unsafe movement of machinery and people. The steps we take to achieve this are object classification, object tracking, real-time alerting on sites such as lights and sirens, data collection for reporting and workplace analysis and finally, retraining of the models. The Edge device runs Green Grass Core, Lambdas and our OpenCV implementation. This forms the platform for the next stage of using SageMaker and Inference ML in future. The intelligence in our approach lies with the Correlation Tracker and Proximity Engine, allowing us to continuously collect, monitor and alert locally while using Lambdas to publish to IoT topics for further analytics. We wanted to make sure we could run on the edge with a high degree of autonomy and resilience which was critical for this safety application. The architecture allows each site to operate autonomously but still allows our client to collect data centrally for organization-wide safety performance and review. This first video shows the tracking of people and vehicles. The white line shows the historical direction while the light blue line shows the predicted trajectory. As the vehicle approaches a parked car, the car is highlighted red and a warning triggered. However we need to be extremely accurate and fast. In the top left we track people even when behind cars. Towards the bottom, we identify people as soon as they move into shots. As an example of collision detection, a person is on their mobile phone and likely to collide with the other person crossing the road. Thank you for watching. We at Big Mate are pleased to share our experience and hope it drives some new great ideas. Now, I can assure you that uh, those two people are okay. There was no one armed when they collided. Uh, so now you have this option of processing data. You can do the inference, but you can do the processing in, at the edge or in the cloud. So how do you make that decision? We tend to think about how you make this decision with three laws or dimensions. So we think of the law of physics. So if there's a low latency response required, like you're in a car and you want to do crash avoidance, for example, then you're thinking about law of physics. You want the processing to be done locally. Also, some of our customers are doing uh, machine learning at the edge in shipping at sea and in airliners and in remote locations. So you want to consider if, you, if you're going to be without an internet connection as well. The law of economics talks about the fact that we're generating lots and lots of data and more and more data all the time, but our networks just aren't quite keeping pace. So it's quite expensive to move lots of data around. So one of the great things about doing image recognition at the edge is I'm not having to stream that video to the edge. I don't need a guaranteed bandwidth and uh, expensive networks. And then the law of the land, for reasons of privacy and compliance, a lot of our customers uh, want to do the processing at the edge so that you're not storing this video. You don't have the, the uh, ownership of maintaining a large platform where this data is stored. You can just do the processing where it's collected. And also there are legal reasons and regulations why you might have to do processing at the edge. So when you're thinking about, do I want to do this processing in Lambda in the cloud or the processing in Lambda down in my uh, edge device, think about it in these three laws. And when you're looking at across the landscape from devices to the cloud, we've got services and features like Amazon Freatos for our microcontroller devices, green grass for edge, and all the way up to cloud devices. And when we're talking about uh, edge processing, we're talking about green grass. And one of the 
benefits of uh, the AWS platform is that we have a common programming model across this. So instead of doing device programming and needing specialist development skills, you can use the same cloud development models that you've used in the cloud right through to your edge devices. And there's a lot of interesting things happening in this green grass uh, area. So we've got gateways. You've got in hardened industrial gateways that you can put in your facilities if you want to do some predictive maintenance or you want to do some image recognition in, say, an industrial solution. We've got Rio Tinto. I've put these in their haul trucks. And of course, I've already mentioned autonomous vehicles. It's great for that. Uh, if you've got a data center and existing infrastructure and you need that low latency or uh, you want to do uh, uh, local processing, you have that as an option. And also in infrastructure, there's a new uh, service coming to a lot of mobile providers called Mobile Edge Access Compute, which is providing compute at the edge of mobile networks. So if you get uh, into your future thinking, you might be able to uh, author Lambda functions and then have them running uh, at the edge of your mobile network, close to where your customers are. And some other use cases that we're seeing, image recognition is a, an obvious one that we've already talked about. Some people are using audio recognition to detect faults in industrial settings, so understanding when the machines sound bad. Predictive maintenance is another common use case where people are looking at failure of shipping engines, they're looking at uh, turbojets, they're looking at uh, other things like that, and they're feeding that data into the cloud. They're training a model on when failure is likely, but then they're deploying that model down to their factory so they get an early warning on a, you know, a part failing or a machine part failing. So there's some of the common use cases we're seeing. And Greengrass has many options uh, available to it. We've got three languages supported uh, for Lambda and Greengrass. We've got more Linux distributions coming and also Docker coming soon. And VMware is in preview. That allows you to, to make use of ex existing infrastructure. Now, what happened to my car? Well, me and six cars ended up not so good. The car, unfortunately, was a write-off. And just today, we're picking up a new car. And uh, I'll just use this moment to say goodbye to my lovely Honda Odyssey. And uh, hello to my new car, which I'm picking up. Um, oh, well, my wife's picking up today. And if you're looking at IoT solutions, one of the things that we're seeing across the market is that a lot of organizations don't necessarily have all those IoT skills. So if you want to do large runs of manufacturing, you need someone who's good at IoT integration, or you're looking for an end-to-end -end solution. We've got partners across the board. One of the benefits of being first in the cloud is that we've built this really large partner ecosystem. And we've got some here today as well. The guys from Big Mate are mingling around. And out in the hall is also an image recognition partner called Genviz, who I was just checking out before if you're interested in seeing what people are building in this space. If you get your chance to get your hands on a deep lens, we uh, had a community uh, project when these were in pre-release. There's some great projects you can go check out the GitHubs. You can check out how the, there was one that read books to children. There was another one that uh, did uh, interpretation of sign language. There's some great projects for you to go check out. And as always, uh, please provide feedback. That's how we understand whether you're, you're getting value out of these sessions and how we can add more, uh, more information to, to help you on your cloud duty. Uh, journey. So thank you very much for listening today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you.